decades before 9-11, the United States is attacked by terrorists. American businesses are bombed. Innocent people are slaughtered. Symbols of liberty become targets for destruction. The terrorists are mobile, well-organized, and deadly. As the violence escalates, their victims have but one hope, the FBI. In the 1970s, cities across the United States became a battleground for vicious Croatian radicals. Their violent agenda targeted their own people living in America. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents all over the country worked to unravel a complex web of extortions, bombings, and assassinations. At stake were the lives of innocent Croatian families trying to build a new life in America. New York City, 1977. On the morning of June 14th, three men approached the Yugoslav diplomatic mission to the United Nations. Outside the mission, a New York City police officer stands guard. Inside, Yugoslav security agents protect the embassy. One of them asks the visitors for identification. Go, go. Hearing the shot, police officers rush into the building. Foreign missions are technically outside the NYPD's jurisdiction. The officers are now in Yugoslav territory. As backup arrives, the officers inside the mission try to negotiate with the three men, but they have barricaded themselves in an upper office. The intruders warn they have taken a woman hostage. They will kill her if anyone tries to enter. One officer offers himself as a substitute hostage. Take me for the hostage. The gunmen refuse. Agents from the FBI's New York field office respond to the scene. According to federal law, the FBI is responsible for investigating all attacks on foreign missions. Special Agent Len Cross. As I arrived, we had police officers in the park. We had police officers on surrounding buildings with uh, scoped rifles. And then we had the uh, emergency service units making entry into the building. What was going through my mind was, you know, what was happening on the inside. The suspects appear in an upstairs window brandishing a Croatian flag. They toss propaganda leaflets into the street. The leaflets call on the United Nations to force communist Yugoslavia to grant Croatia its independence. What they were trying to do was gain publicity for their cause and showing the oppressive regime that existed in Yugoslavia and how they were oppressing the Croatian people. A hostage negotiator talks to the suspects for nearly two hours. They finally agree to come out but only if they are taken into custody by U.S. authorities, not Yugoslav officials. They were just trying to protect themselves from the officials because they knew if, uh, if they got their hands on them, they'd kill them. Easy. And then finally, when they realized it was the New York City police, and the FBI on the other side of the door and assured them that no harm would come to them, they surrendered uh, without incident. The suspects reveal that they never had a hostage. They were only bluffing to prevent Yugoslav security agents from mounting an armed assault. As the police officers escort the suspects out of the building, mission security confronts them. It 
They tell the officers to hand over the radicals. This is Yugoslavian mission. You have no right here. This is territory of Yugoslavia. Put the guns down. The NYPD officers refuse. Step aside. No. Lower your weapon. They intend to leave the mission with the prisoners. We're taking our prisoners out. Lower the guns. The security agents finally back down. The invasion of a foreign mission on U.S. soil is unprecedented. One of their employees has been seriously wounded. Special Agent Cross now leads the investigation. He searches for a possible motive for the attack. He starts by analyzing the long history of hatred and violence between Yugoslav Serbs and Croatians as they fought over the same Eastern European lands. The reasons and motives stretched centuries where Serbians would go into Croatian villages and kill every man, woman, and child, and the Croatians would reciprocate. 1971, the violence spread outside Yugoslavia. Croatian radicals assassinated the Yugoslav ambassador to Sweden. In 1972, they hijacked a Swedish airliner and forced the government to release seven political prisoners from jail. Later that same year, Croatian terrorists claimed responsibility for planting a bomb on board a Yugoslav airliner. The blast killed 26 innocent people. I mean, the, the hatred was so deep and it was hard to fathom. We were dealing also with trying to understand culture, cultural uh, and historical issues. And, and it was not your simple uh, criminal matter. It was a lot of payback on both sides. Now, that payback is spread from Europe to the United States. It's a terrifying trend. Cross contacts fellow FBI agents at US embassies around the world. They confirm that there has been a disturbing increase in Croatian attacks on Yugoslav embassies and diplomats worldwide. Special Agent Cross works closely with police and prosecutors, providing background information on the men who attacked the Yugoslav mission. Four months later, on October 13th, a New York jury finds all three men guilty of conspiring to take hostage Yugoslavia's ambassador to the United Nations. The jury also convicts the gunman who wounded the Yugoslav security agent of assault with a deadly weapon. For Agent Cross, the case is officially closed. But everything he has learned tells him that Croatian terrorism in the United States is on the rise and about to explode. Nine months later, in Chicago, Cross's fears become a grim reality. Croatian businessmen begin calling the FBI in a panic. They have each received an anonymous letter written in Serbo-Croatian. The letters demand a large sum of money and threatens horrific consequences if the recipient fails to pay up. Special Agent Bjarn Borison of the FBI's Chicago field office examines the letters. Yesterday. Borison speaks fluent Serbo-Croatian and has a background in counterintelligence. They said, you are not doing your part in our cause to overthrow the communist government. We've assessed your situation and decided that you are capable of paying this amount of money. And they would instruct them to send this money to an address in Paraguay. And if you fail to do that, you'll pay the consequences. It's absolutely extortion. That's the way the FBI looked at it. Was yeah, this was an extortion attempt, and they were threatening your well-being if you didn't cooperate. Agents are unsure whether the culprits are Serb spies or Croatian criminals. Thank you. Thank you. But they do know the extortionists have cast a wide net. Nationwide, the FBI collects a total of 52 extortion letters from Croatian businessmen. The letters are nearly identical, but with one key exception. The senders demand a different amount of money from each victim. Most of the people who received those extortion letters were well off, or at least comfortable individuals, and had the ability to pay that money that was requested. In New York City, Special Agent Len Cross heads the investigation into the extortion letters. Searching for leads, he contacts Pero Vuchas, a prominent Croatian political writer living in Queens. 
he was known to be against the violence and we felt that he might be an individual who could perhaps assist us in terms of identifying who may be responsible for these letters. Agent Cross asks Vuchas if he thinks the extortionists could be fellow Croatians. He did not feel any good Croatian would have written these letters uh, and made the demands that were made in these letters. Instead, Vuchas blames the Serb government of Yugoslavia. He told me that it was his belief that these letters were generated by the Yugoslavian intelligence service to try to disrupt the Croatian community. The majority were peaceful, and they wanted to uh, overthrow the Yugoslav government, but by peaceful means. But there was always those who wanted to use more violent means and would do anything to achieve that, that, that goal. Vucic believes the letters are an attempt by Serbian spies to sabotage Croatian demands for freedom. I left him my card, told him if he could think of anything else, please just to give me a call, and um, we would appreciate it. In Chicago, Agent Borison focuses on the letter's demand to send money to a post office box in the South American country of Paraguay. The address in Paraguay was of key significance to us because somebody had to collect that money, so they had to zero in on who that might be. The FBI sends an agent from the U.S. Embassy in Argentina to Paraguay to investigate. The agent observes a man receiving the money. He is later identified as a known Croatian terrorist who in 1972 had shot the Yugoslav ambassador to Sweden. A month later, in New York City, the case takes a dramatic turn. A man calls local news stations claiming two bombs have been planted in New York City, one at the United Nations, the other at Grand Central Station. In 1978, the FBI investigates a group of Croatian terrorists who use extortion to fund their cause. In New York, two local television stations receive a call from a man who claims two bombs have been planted in New York City. One is at the United Nations. Outside a library at the UN compound, a police officer finds a suspicious looking bag. The officer immediately calls in the NYPD bomb squad. Investigators find a note nearby written in Serbo Croatian. It demands Croatian independence and says, quote, This is the beginning. Our decision is kamikaze. Bomb technicians carefully dismantle the device. It's armed with dynamite and a blasting cap. The timer is set to explode within the hour. It was designed to go off, it's just that it malfunctioned. At Grand Central Station, police find the second bomb stashed inside a locker. Again, the device is accompanied by a letter demanding Croatian independence. If either of the devices had detonated, the loss of life and property would have been disastrous. The writing was on the wall. Things are becoming more and more violent and they were happening more frequently. The FBI believes it's only a matter of time before someone is killed. Agents from the New York field office combined forces. We felt that it would be a good idea to bring all the case agents together on one squad under one supervisor where we could exchange and coordinate our activities. Special Agent Cross also proposes the coordination of a nationwide effort. If we did not, my prediction was that uh, all hell was going to break loose. Two weeks later, in a wealthy suburb of New York, a successful businessman is gunned down outside his own home. His only crime, he's a Croatian immigrant who refused to submit to extortion. The FBI's worst fears have been realized. An extortion target has been murdered, and agents have no viable leads. In Chicago, 
Special Agent Bjorn Borison becomes concerned that Croatian Americans in his area will also be targeted. It wasn't an empty threat they made in that extortion letter. They meant it. And we didn't know who they'd come after, so we had to contact all those individuals who'd received those letters to warn them and advise them they could be a possible target. And at the same time, try to identify who's responsible. The FBI also alerts other law enforcement agencies to watch for anyone purchasing illegal weapons or bomb-making materials. A few days later, the Chicago field office receives a call from the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. A known Croatian radical is trying to buy dynamite. They had just got an individual in a sting operation who had purchased uh, two cases of dynamite from them. This individual met with the ATF undercover agents thinking he was buying real dynamite, but they actually sold him dummy dynamite. The buyer's name is Ivo Afinic. He is a high-ranking member of a Croatian independence group called Otpur. Obviously, they have plans to do a lot more bombs. And that's why they were buying this. The name of the organization is Hrvatski Narodni Otpor, which means Croatian National Resistance. So the word Otpor means resistance. While the majority of Otpor members are law-abiding citizens, the FBI suspects that there may be a criminal faction operating within the organization intent on extorting and murdering fellow Croatians. The, uh, all right, guys, we're gonna pop this door, we're gonna go in, we got some... Uh, Otpour meets at a Croatian social club on the south side of Chicago. In a joint operation, FBI and ATF agents raid the club, searching for bomb-making materials. Investigators find the two cases of fake dynamite, but there are no live explosives anywhere in the club. A thorough search fails to turn up enough evidence to press charges against Evo a finish. That same day, in a nearby Chicago neighborhood, Daniel Nikolic opens up his shop. Nikolic is one of dozens of Croatian-American businessmen who have received an extortion letter. The cabinet maker refused to be bullied. Chicago police, the Chicago Fire Department, ATF agents, and the FBI investigate. We did a search of the premises, and we determined that a bomb had been detonated on the roof of the cabinet shop. Special Agent Borison interviews Daniel Nikolic. There was no doubt who he thought was responsible, and that was the Opor leadership, as a result of his failure to pay the extortion letter that he received. With Nikolic's help, the FBI talks to members of the Croatian community. Their top priority is to find a confidential informant inside Otpur, familiar with the organization's violent activities. The key to almost any investigation is you have to develop someone inside the organization who's willing to cooperate with you. But the Chicago FBI has trouble finding anyone who will talk about Otpur. About the, uh, Serbian to get someone that was actually inside the group is very hard, because it wasn't that big a group who was actually responsible for the violence. It was a small group. And it's very difficult to find someone inside that small group who's going to cooperate with you. While agents try to recruit an informant in Chicago, Pasadena, California, becomes the group's next target. On the morning of November 22nd, a Croatian businessman steps outside his home and into the gun sights of an assassin. The victim had received an extortion letter five months earlier, but he refused to support the Otpur cause. Local police and the FBI investigate, but they find little evidence. In San Francisco, home to a large Croatian-American population, Agents mount an all-out effort to penetrate Otpur before they kill again. The FBI assigns Special Agent Bob Gorth, who speaks fluent Serbo-Croatian, to the full-time task of recruiting a confidential informant. The FBI was having a problem with penetrating the Croatian community for the same reason that uh, you have trouble in any ethnic terrorist field. The criminal act is a result of their nationalism. Whether or not they're involved, they will stand together as a community against 
law enforcement. With a background in Yugoslavian counterintelligence, Special Agent Gorth understands the bitter conflict between the Croatians and the Serbs. Not as often as I can. Uh, Yugoslavia was an artificial country. It uh, uh, was born after World War I. The Croatians fundamentally were constantly fighting to get out from under what they considered Serb domination. His understanding of the culture helps him enter San Francisco's Croatian community. I was very unbureau in a way. No suit and tie, no anything. A lot of times can, conversations were over a, over a beer, over a bar table. We had to find a way to, to break down the wall and to convince someone on the inside who had information that what they were doing was morally wrong. It had to be a matter of conscience and a matter of actual conversion of thought. From San Francisco to Chicago to New York, FBI agents compare notes, trying to find an insider who can give them any information on the mysterious tight-knit terror group. The FBI's lead case agent in New York is Len Cross. It was around 6 o'clock at night, and we were going over our leads and trying to get an idea what do we need to do next, and I received a phone call. Agent Cross, for you, he wouldn't say. It sounded urgent. After four months of silence, Peiro Vuchas, the Croatian activist writer, is desperate to talk to Cross. And he says, I need to talk to you, and I need to talk to you now. I got a threatening letter, and he says, I'm going to tell you everything. I know who's all responsible. The call may be the break the FBI needs. So I says, OK, I'm, I'm coming right over. I says, I'll meet you right at your house. Other agents from the New York field office accompany Cross to the meeting. They says, no, you're not going, we're going to go with you, because I mean, this could be a setup. They could be trying to get you. Nationwide. FBI agents try to infiltrate a deadly terrorist organization that extorts and murders their fellow Croatian immigrants. Peiro Vuchas, a Croatian political writer, asks Special Agent Len Cross to come to his house. He's finally willing to talk. He was very concerned, very scared, and he proceeded to show me this letter. It was essentially telling him that he didn't shut up and didn't get his act together that uh, something very bad was gonna happen to him. He realized at this point that these guys meant business and that he was in their crosshairs. And that his only alternative was to reach out to the FBI, you know, put his trust in them, that they can get the job done. The writer tells Agent Cross that he believes members of Otpur are behind the letters and the violence. And he says they're criminals, they're just a bunch of criminals that have infiltrated the, the Croatian organizations. At that point, he laid it out who all the king players were throughout the country. He couldn't tell us who wrote their letters, but what he did tell us is these are the guys that are running the whole operation. According to Vuchas, Outpour's North American headquarters is in Chicago. Some of the key terrorists live in the Midwestern United States. It was really good information and, and definitely kind of was starting to fill in the puzzle. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, agents contact a Croatian priest who the FBI learns is influential throughout the Midwestern Croatian community. Sit down. Please. Father Bradish is an outspoken opponent of violence. Agents believe he may provide valuable leads. An FBI agent from the Milwaukee field office interviews him at the Catholic elementary school where he works. As they talk, Father Bradish opens his mail. One package contains a book. The agent spots a wire. He observed batteries, wires, and explosives. The agent, being concerned for the, the location that it was in an elementary school with young kids, grabbed the book, and he ran outside. The Milwaukee police sends a bomb technician to disable the device. Tragically, the blasting cap explodes, taking off part of the technician's hand. The FBI issues a warning to the 52 extortion victims that they've identified across the country. Beware of book-sized packages wrapped in brown paper. The next day, 
in Queens, New York. Pedro Vuchas picks up his mail. Inside his post office box, he finds a note telling him that he has a package. The postal worker can't find it. No, please, will you look one more time? It has to be here. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you. The package has been stored on a shelf near the counter. It looks like a book. I don't want it. I'll come back for it later. Vujas contacts Special Agent Len Cross. I received a call telling me I've got a bomb. It's at the post office. Says, you want me to go get it? I says, no, leave it there. I says, we're going to get the bomb squad. We'll take it from there. At the FBI lab, a bomb expert studies the package. It is nearly identical to a device sent to Milwaukee. This book bomb uh, was very similar in construction. The uh, cutout looked the same. The firing system was the same. The same type of dynamite, same type of blasting cap. The postmarks on the packaging reveal that both bombs were mailed from Akron, Ohio on the same day. Agents alert Ohio authorities of the likelihood that the bomb maker lives in their area. In Cleveland, police search the home of Pavel Chotoras. The Croatian radical is their chief suspect in the bombing of a Croatian bookstore five days earlier. Spread it out a little bit. Special Agent Bjarn Borison. During the search, they found a book that was hollowed out and was obviously a book bomb. The bomb is a prototype. Once again, there are no live explosives on the premises. Without further evidence, no arrest can be made. Investigators try to link the prototype to the book bombs mailed to Milwaukee and Queens. Every bomb maker has his own unique style. And of course, one of the reasons for doing that is safety. You want to do it the same way every time, because if you've changed anything, it's very dangerous to wire a book bomb. In the lab, Special Agent Denny Klein compares all three devices. Each book is hollowed out to the same depth. The glue and solder used to construct the devices each have the same chemical composition. Even minute tool marks on the bomb's wiring match. The belief of the laboratory was that this was a prototype uh, that was used to make the uh, two earlier bombs. There is no way to know how many more bombs have been constructed from the prototype. March 17, 1980. New Yorkers and tourists pack Fifth Avenue to watch the city's annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. 10.55 a.m. A bomb explodes at the 30th floor office of a Yugoslav bank. FBI agents respond, including Special Agent Ken Maxwell. We were doing interviews of the, um, uh, the employees of the bank, the employees of the neighboring offices, the maintenance people in the building, delivery people, anybody who would even come remotely close to 505th Avenue that day. The only significant evidence agents find is another note in which Oatpour claims responsibility. The terrorists issue a chilling threat. The bomb attacks will continue until Croatia is free. On June 3, 1980, the terrorists target one of America's most cherished symbols of freedom, the Statue of Liberty. On June 3, 1980, Croatian terrorists target one of America's most cherished symbols of freedom, the Statue of Liberty. Special Agent Ken Maxwell helps investigate the bombing. Someone had gotten into what they called the museum story room at the base of the statue that tells you the whole history of how the statue was built and all of the wonderful history in the pictures and plus the souvenir shop. All of that had been blown to smithereens. It, it, considerable amount of damage had been done uh, throughout the base of the statue. 
A number of violent groups claim responsibility for the bombing, including the Palestinian Liberation Organization, anti-Castro Cubans, and even neo-Nazis. Multiple claims of credit back in the early 80s was not an unusual phenomenon. Investigators painstakingly search for pieces of the bomb, expecting that the evidence will help them determine which group is responsible. Hey, guys, looks like I got a wire over here. We spent all night there, sifting through all of the rubble and debris, and came up with quite a few components. The components of the improvised explosive device were strikingly similar to previous Croatian-related bombings. What began as an attempt to extort dozens of Croatian Americans has escalated into a campaign of violence. The Statue of Liberty was the greatest symbol of attraction for potential terrorists because of what it stood for. In their mind, the United States was not um, listening to their cause. So let's bring the cause to their attention and let's show them, the, the United States, that this is a real issue to us and almost trying to uh, extort the United States of America to help them achieve independence. But the terrorists' logic is flawed. The attack only fuels authorities to intensify their investigation. Nice. Bombing our Statue of Liberty, it's a slap in the face. So what we did, we started to focus our resources, our investigative attention on several individuals who we strongly suspected were involved in this kind of activity. In New York, the FBI sets up intensive surveillance on several key terror suspects. In San Francisco, FBI Special Agent Bob Gorth continues his efforts to recruit an informant inside the terrorist ring. But I spent over a year doing nothing but contacting Croatians. It's very important to understand the people, to speak their language, to understand where they come from, even to a degree to empathize with them so that you can talk to them in terms that they understand and appreciate. I interviewed over 300, I think, of all stripes, persuasions, and types, trying to find the right source. I finally found a man who uh, indicated he'd like to talk again. Hadn't told me anything, but he'd like to talk again. After talking to him, I don't know how many times, we began to build a rapport. And finally, he, he said, I think I, I'll help. Finding a source of information inside Otpor is a major break for the FBI. After thoroughly debriefing the informant in San Francisco, the FBI sends him to New York to gather intelligence on the most recent Croatian bombings. He originally had lived in New York, and uh, he was well acquainted with the people. The informant renews old friendships with Croatian radicals. He would have been killed if members of Otpor Command had found out that he was the man. Despite the risk, he probes for details about their plans. If you could obtain inside information on what's going on in a criminal enterprise, it means a tremendous amount in terms of achieving success in an investigation. The informant learns that the group intends to assassinate an outspoken critic of Otpur. Take care of him. The target is Pero Vuchas, the prominent Croatian political writer. They were going to kill him uh, with a, a rifle as he was walking his daughter, to, his six-year-old daughter, to school in the morning. If they missed, they could hit his six-year-old daughter. Uh, they had no concern for her, and uh, most of the agents and the detectives uh, working this case, they all had kids, so, you know, they are thinking in terms of a father. How could they do such a thing like this? According to the informant, the ruthless plot is already in motion. Special Agent Ken Maxwell watches as two suspected terrorists park a van near the target's home. What was very unusual is that they got out of the front of the van and went in, th in the back of the van and removed. 
removed one of the rear windows and substituted one of the windows with a cardboard panel. And although we could not see totally inside the van, we did know they weren't having a bagel and coffee in the back of that van. They were looking to assassinate him. In New York, agents believe Croatian assassins intend to shoot Pero Vucas as he walks his six-year-old daughter to school. Vucas has been working with the FBI to identify the terrorists. Special Agent Len Cross warns Vucas to stay inside his apartment. If they had made an attempt to get out of the car, and proceed to his residence, then we saw what would appear to be a weapon. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. They were gonna be taken down, period. Fortunately, Vuchas and his daughter remain hidden, forcing the snipers to abandon their deadly plot. The FBI decides to set up electronic surveillance on a man they believe to be the mastermind behind the East Coast bombings, the president of Otpur, Stepan Sacic. He was directing the operations here in New York and naturally would be the place to, to put the, uh, the wiretap, especially in view of the fact that uh, the individuals came to him, and that's where they had their meetings. Special Agent Bjarn Borison. It's very difficult to go into a building and place a wire without leaving any trace that you were there. And, uh, and the FBI is quite good at that. What are they talking about? They very nearby, we set up a listening post, and we'd have at least one translator there at all times. Their job is to translate Croatian to English, Pieces are the bomb as well as identify each voice on the tape. They must also decipher any code words used by the terrorists. They won't come out and say words like dynamite. They may say things or pieces. The drop-off, which is the device delivery, and the package is the bomb. It took a while for us to get a grasp as to what are they talking about? and get the significance of the, of the phraseology they use. The conspirators meet often, usually in the rec room in Sacic's basement. Jako Drevan, one of the men who tried to assassinate Peiro Vucas, is Sacic's lieutenant. Translators work day and night analyzing their conversations. The wiretap would run 24 hours a day and we had to constantly monitor the conversations because they're talking about bombing, assassinating people. Agents are still trying to pin down specifics, places, dates, the identities of the co-conspirators. It was all part of the puzzle that had all the pieces be pulled together in order to form the, enough evidence to start the prosecution. Under federal racketeering laws, the FBI needs hard evidence of a conspiracy to take down the entire organization. Special Agent Ken Maxwell. But one particular night, their shaking of the pinball machine shook loose a wire that was used in the installation of the microphone. Stop. It looked like a plain wire. It didn't look like it had a, a head that a normal microphone would have. So if you saw it, you might even know what it is. On the other end, the translators can hear the conspirators talking about the wire. What they were saying was, what is that? And one of them realized rather quickly, because he had done all of the electrical work for the house, I didn't put that wire there. They knew there was something there that didn't belong there. Now the next question is, do they know what it is? The conspirators begin following the wire. And they traced that wire out of the basement to the power source out on the street and ripped the wire out. For the FBI, the tap is critical. To the great credit of our special operations folks, 
They reinstalled, and they reinstalled within 24 hours. I think the bad guys thought they had won in that instance, not realizing our persistence. And this time, we avoided the pinball machine. Agents hear Stepan Sacic and Yako Drevin planning an upcoming operation. They were talking about, let's get ready. I want you to do this. I want you to smash this. And we knew they were getting ready to bomb something. Agents learn that Opor intends to bomb a Yugoslav dance studio, scheduled to host a gala attended by the Yugoslav ambassador to the United Nations, Special Agent Len Cross. They were going to have over 300 people there. At this point, this really raised our concerns because now they're going after groups and not concerned about who gets hurt. Agents tail driven. He drives to Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he visits the home of a man named Vuka Yulich. When he went into the residence, he went in empty-handed. When he came out, he had a, a good-sized brown bag, and there seemed to be some bulky stuff inside the bag. Agents follow Drevin back to New York City, where he picks up another Otpur foot soldier. The men drive on toward their target. And they circled a block in Manhattan and kept circling it and circling it. Agents watch as Drevin cases the building. He leaves the suspicious bag behind in the van. It was decided that if they remove the bag, then we were going to arrest them. Certainly, we were not going to take the chance of a potential bombing in midtown Manhattan. As the suspect returns to the van, the agents watch his every move, ready to take the terrorists down. In New York, agents tail two suspected Croatian terrorists. An FBI surveillance operation has revealed that a radical faction of Otpur is planning to place a bomb at a reception for 300 people. The terrorists case the building and then leave the area. Agents suspect that they have a bomb in their van. The FBI cannot risk a terror attack on hundreds of innocent people. Agents obtain search warrants to raid the homes of Stepan Sacic and Yako Drev. FBI! In Drevin's home, Special Agent Ken Maxwell finds a familiar-looking bag in a closet. When I looked into the shopping bag, I saw a woman's pocketbook that was open. And inside the pocketbook were sticks of dynamite wrapped up in tape, a timing device, a, 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 an alarm clock, an electric blasting cap, and wire. It's not every day that you find a bomb at your feet. Authorities take Drevin into custody. Across town, Special Agent Len Cross and his team search the home of Stepan Sacic, the president of Otpur. One of my uh, team members was going through a pile of paint drop cloths. And he found the scoped rifle, and he found the ammunition. Investigators suspect Sacic's co-conspirators used the rifle weeks earlier in a plot to murder political writer and FBI cooperator Pero Vuchas. Agents arrest Sacic for conspiracy under RICO, the federal racketeering statute. He was advised of his rights, and uh, he, he refused. He wasn't being very cooperative. No, I don't think so. Four days later, FBI agents and police raid the Bridgeport, Connecticut home of Vuka Yulich. Towards the window. What is all about? Face the window. Yulich provided Drevin with the bomb earmarked for the dance studio. We have a warrant to search the premises. A bomb tech, as he moved some clothes, observed there on the floor in a bag, considerable amount of dynamite. And sitting on top of the dynamite 
were electric blasting caps, live electric blasting caps. Agents arrest Vuka Yulich. Don't you worry about it. We'll take care of it from here. Special Agent Cross. They call Special Agent Cross in New York to inform him they have found one of Otpur's primary bomb makers. Special Agent Cross. Cross again questions Stepan Sacic, asking him if he knows a man by the name of Vuka Yulich. He says, yeah, a little I do. I says, uh, you're gonna have, you got some problems. And we've just arrested him. And I says, he had a large quantity of explosives and caps and weapons in his house. Sacic still refuses to talk. New York investigators call in Special Agent Bob Gorth from San Francisco to question Eulich. The former Otpur member turned confidential informant accompanies him. Late in the afternoon, with the moral support of the Croatian cooperator, Julic finally begins to open up. He wanted uh, the feeling that a uh, fellow Croatian believed in him, trusted him, and he wouldn't be entirely alone. And uh, when he finally got the courage up, he said, yeah, I want to talk about it. And of course, that was the linchpin of the whole case. Vuka Julic tells investigators how other Otpur members convinced him to kill a Croatian community leader in California two years earlier. After drinking all one evening and into the morning, he decided he'd strike a blow for Croatian freedom and go kill this enemy of the people. So he did. And uh, later on, he realized that what he'd done was not advancing the Croatian cause, but really was harming it. He was one of the few people that I firmly believe regretted what he did. Yulich agrees to testify against Sacic, Drevan, and the other Croatian terrorists. This is the key testimony prosecutors need to take down the entire terrorist ring. His cooperation in this case was instrumental in breaking the back of an organized crime organization, wherein in four cities we literally took out the godfathers of four families. The RICO statute, originally enacted to stop organized crime, is used for the first time to fight terrorism. Within two years, 11 members of the Otpur organization are convicted and sentenced to up to 40 years in prison. If you're going to achieve any kind of success in terrorism, you have to be able to bring to the playing field the right kind of players, the right kind of knowledge, and the right kind of resource, if you even hope to put a dent into it. The Rambo approach is not going to win over terrorists. Terrorists are motivated by the extreme sense of nationalism. And if you're going to deal with them, you've got to get into their hearts and minds. Otherwise, you may stop them on a particular incident, but you haven't changed their minds. And if you don't change their minds, they'll do it again. For the FBI and law enforcement nationwide, dismantling Otpur was a vital achievement. Terrorists operating inside U.S. borders were stopped dead in their tracks.